Well, good morning. I am glad you are here today. Welcome to Summit. Um, it's important to me that you understand that for the next little bit that we're together, um, I'm, it was occurring to me while I was on the stage and praying that I'm, I'm, I'm holding a sword, so I must be at a battle. And so my desire for you in the next little time that we're together is to fight so hard for you to see the joy that is in Jesus Christ. So we're in Mark chapter 4, and we've been going through the series on Mark, and we've been looking for these, and, and John, I'm going to say it wrong because I never understand where you put this stuff, because I was just told to read it, not speak it, but Kairos, 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 I'm going to say Kairos, I got it on my shirt, and um, we've been looking at, talking about those moments, this idea of an opportune time, this, this, this certain time, a particular time. And I think often we've been kind of looking at it for this idea of, for me, I'm looking for my opportune time. I'm looking for when is it my time, when is it my season? And that is not what God is about. He is and he isn't. But he created time for his purposes, and he created you for his purposes and so if you're in a, a season of opportunity or season of blessing or a season of whatever, it is not for you. It is for others and it is for Christ. It is for his glory. I have a little lamp over here. I put the lamp there. It's, it's orange. It's on a pink stool. It's clashing greatly to all of you people who know things like design and colors and I don't know anything like that. But... I put it up there because I wanted to illustrate a purpose. And the purpose is that um, that's the passage that we're going in today, is Mark chapter 4, verse 21. It's a familiar passage. You probably already noticed if I'm saying that and I'm talking about a passage, you're like, yeah, I know what we're going to talk about. Good. That'll make things easier. Um, I have a question about whether or not the bulb's going to stay lit. If it goes out, let's imagine that it's still lit, all right? Let's just put on our caps and imagine that it's still lit, all right? So Mark chapter 4, verse 21. We know that Jesus has been talking to people. A lot of, a big crowd has gathered around him. He's, he's gotten into a boat. He's talking to people. And, and this is in chapter 4, the beginning of part, where he talks about the parable of the sower, um, you know, in the parable, the sower is pretty straightforward, but we even get an explanation, which is kind of nice. Uh, I'm a big fan of explanation. I, I like knowing why things are the way they are. Um, I like seeing the logic and reason within things. Uh, it helps me um, to understand. And so in the parable of the sower, Jesus talks about that there's this guy who goes out and he throws some seed and it goes on different soil. And then later the disciples come and, and, and he, he talks to them in verse 10. He says, and when he was alone, those around him uh, with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in a parable. And so he goes on from 13 all the way down to 20 and he explains the parable. He says, you know, this seed that lands on that soil is like this. This seed that lands on that soil is like this. You have some other seed that produces a crop. And, and, and that's the seed we want to be. That's the seed that Jesus is saying, be like this seed. And then we get to 21, and he shifts. And he says, and he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? And that's what we're going to preach about today. So we'll, we'll see. Let's pray. So, Father, it is important that we understand that we're in a battle not only for salvation and not only for our souls and for the spiritual realms that, is, that are around us, God, that we're in a battle for joy and for hope that is only possibly found in you. And God, so we may know that and we may read that and we may understand that, but connect our hearts to it is what we're asking you to do today. Because head knowledge is one thing, but heart knowledge is another. 
God, you, you say in the parables that people might hear it, but they, they might not understand it. So, Lord, that you would make your word clear today for our understanding and for your purposes. That, that we would see what you, what you had in mind when you were talking about this illustration you were giving. God, we, w- we want to draw close to you. This week has been very hard. Many of us have been brought to our knees. And God, we draw strength from knowing that you are near to the brokenhearted. God, we draw strength from knowing that you are omnipotent, that you are all powerful. And God, we draw strength from knowing that you are good and you are faithful and you give us your word so that we can know you. In all things, so that we can know you. And it's in your name we pray, amen. So here it is, verse 21. And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to this little group plus his disciples, is a lamp to be brought in and put under a basket, under a bed, or is it to be put on a stand? And so my question is, is that when I, when I read that, because I, I come this idea of like trying to understand things, what is the purpose of the lamp? What's, what's the purpose of a lamp in general? You know, what would you say? What's the purpose of a lamp? Anybody, what you got? Bring to bring light, to light up a room. We've got a lot of people know about lamps in here. That's good. That's good. If we ever fold as a church, maybe an electrical thing, maybe, I don't know, uh, maybe a lamp store. And so um, that would have been easier than saying electrical thing. Um, so, you know, it's to give light. The purpose of a lamp is to give light. The purpose of a lamp is not to be lit. It's not the purpose. Now listen, hear the difference there. It is not the purpose of a lamp to be lit. You know, having it right here and just going like this. I'm going to move the lamp away from the speakers. Having it like this, that is not the purpose. The purpose is what you said. The purpose is that it gives light, not that it comes on. That's, that's the point. That's what I'm trying to, trying to make today. If you are in Christ, you were saved for a purpose. You were saved for a purpose. You, you weren't saved to be saved. You were saved to get to work. Th- this is not... When, when you came to Christ, it was not the culmination of your life. You were born to start. You were born again to start the work of the kingdom. And so you are not saved so that you can enjoy being saved. Now, you do enjoy being saved, and being saved and close and reconciled unto the Lord is a good thing. And we praise God that we are if we are in Christ. But you are not saved to just sit there and be saved. You're not saved to be lit. You're saved to give light. That's the whole point. You are saved to a purpose. And Scripture makes this really clear in a lot of different ways. But I want to know specifically what is it that the light is talking about? What does the light represent? So we look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 which is easily my favorite passage in Scripture. And people say, oh, well, I don't have any favorite passages in Scripture because I love the whole Bible. I like 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And when I meet the Lord, I'll tell him, your word's really great. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And he'll say, I wrote that. And I'll be like, that's what's up. And so, (laughs) probably won't go down like that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I always understand context, so go back later today and read three. Actually, start with chapter one, read through. It's supposed to be read as a whole letter. Four, therefore, having this ministry of the gospel, is what I have in my head, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with the word of God, but by the open statement of truth, we we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. 
And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, and see this, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That is what Satan wants to do. That is what he is on point for. He wants to blind you from seeing the light. He wants to take a situation, an experience, your upbringing, whatever it is, and he wants to put that in front of you and create a veil so that you cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of God. He wants to put that to where you cannot see it. He wants to put a shade over it to where you can't hear, but where you can't see God, to where in your desperation you have no desire to even fight for joy. You just lay down because it's easier. He's going to make you tired. He's going to make it stressful. He's going to make it really difficult. He's going to create things and problems and see disaster come so that you cannot see God. And it is in those moments that you have to fight for joy. You have to do what you have to do to see Jesus. You have to see the cross. You have to see the cross of Christ and the fact that you were redeemed. You were bought with a price. And this is what's been on my heart for the last month. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. You are not your own. Hear it, Christians. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So when we think about, oh, well, how should I live my life or something, you're immediately wrong. You're immediately wrong. It's not your life. It's not yours to get to choose because you were ransomed by Jesus Christ's blood on the cross. And it's not yours. And that's the battle that we fight every single day, every second. We fight that battle because we want it to be ours. Because the old man that Paul talks about, the flesh, wages war against the spirit. And it doesn't want to die. And we have to put the death, the things of the body. We have to because it isn't ours. We are bought with a price. And the price is the precious blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And often we're not reminded in that, that, that statement, the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't hit us with a weight that it should. It doesn't connect to our heart. It hits in our head. It hits in our ears. We understand what that means logically, mentally. I got a grasp of it. But what I don't see is the weight of it. I don't see the worth of it. I don't see the value of it until I'm driven to a point to where it is all that I can see. At the foot of the cross is where I see Jesus for who he is. That's why Paul talks about, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions so that you can see Jesus. I'm suffering this way so that you can see Jesus. Here is Paul saying, my life is not my own. I'm bought with a price, and the suffering that I am enduring is done so because I'm saved for a purpose, and the purpose is that so you can see Jesus. That's the whole point. So I'm going through this, and I'm going through that, and it's really, really hard. It's really hard for you so that you can be Jesus to other people, so that you can show them this light of the face of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And that is the thing we have to fight for and battle for and wage war for, and we have to sing songs for, because we have to remind ourselves, and it has to resonate within our hearts what it is we believe. It is one thing to sing a song. It is another thing to live a song. And so we have to understand that it is the light. And listen, verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. With ourselves, what? As your servants. For Jesus' sake. I'm your servant for the sake of Christ. Christ. So that you might know Jesus, that's why I exist. 
That's not just something that's on Nick. That's not something that's on John. That's not something that's on the worship team. The reason that you are a Christian and that you are still alive today is so that others might see the gospel of Jesus Christ. You were saved for a purpose. Start working. Start being light. You said, you said earlier, it's not that it's lit, it's that it gives light to everyone. It's that it gives light to the whole room. We're supposed to be this thing all of the time. At work, we are the light of the gospel. In our suffering, we are the light of the gospel. In our joy, we are the light of the gospel because it is God who wills and acts and makes us what he wants us to be. He's the one that saved us. He's the one that bought us. He's the one that ransomed us back from being a slave to sin and shame. We had no way. And that's always what I pray so often when I'm preaching is that just help me to show them there's a better way. There's just a better way. There's a better way than than living this direction. There's a better way, guys, and there's a Savior who loves you. And so instead of throwing your body at some boy because he's telling you you're pretty, no, you have a defined worth that's in Jesus Christ. He says you're worth the cross. So now you walk in freedom to find who he has for you. We don't just do that because somebody's going to validate me. I don't need your affirmations. Now, that doesn't mean be a jerk. As it pertains to you, be at peace with all men. At the same time, it does mean that I don't need you for that. I have that. I am overly and abundantly satisfied that Jesus loves me. And that's what I know. And that's sometimes all we can know is that he loves me. We might not understand it. I think about that all the time. When we allow things and people don't understand it, but we do it because of love. It's hard. It's a hard truth to swallow. It's one that sometimes isn't isn't a light shown to us for years. And that's where we have to fight. We have to fight. We just have to wage war and battle. So it is the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Look at verse 6. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's two times he says that. But look what he's doing in verse 6. For God who said, let the light shine out of the darkness. Where have we heard that before? Genesis 1. Pastor answering stuff. That's not right. This is for the people. Pastor. All right. So anyway. No, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. So from the very beginning, the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ was there since verse 1. Because you'll notice there's no sun until later. And in Revelation, we know that the glory of God replaces the sun. So from the very beginning, God, gospel, proclaimed. Because that is how faith comes, through hearing. And so he is proclaiming, and look at it. What happens? He speaks, and action occurs. Because when God speaks, it doesn't return void. When God speaks, it is action. It is simultaneous. If he is speaking, then he is acting. Let's look a little bit further. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, it's just like the lamp. Believers are not saved just to be saved. They are saved with a purpose. We are saved to give light. We are saved to provide hope. We are saved to say that there is a better way. We are saved to say that there is a king of kings. We are saved to say that there is an eternal love that there is a matchless name, 
that there is one who knows us better than we know ourselves and that he's created us for the purpose that we might tell others. And look at this. This was an example. He doesn't save people for themselves. He saves them for a purpose. And if we look at Scripture, we look at Abraham. So Abraham's this old guy. He doesn't have any kids. And all of a sudden, God gives him a kid, right? Why? I mean, think about this. Uh, look, I know that you, th- you, we, we would say God is good, okay? And uh, we know that, you know, Scripture says that he, he is a good father and that he loves to give good gifts to his children. That idea of if you then being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more so will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we understand that. Okay, so I'm looking at Abraham. He's old. He'd like a kid. So he's praying. And and so he gets a kid. So is that just God's being good? Well, that's that's very nice of God to help that old man out with a child. You know, that is not the reason. Abraham was not given a child for the purpose of Abraham wanted a child. Abraham was given a child so that there could be an Abrahamic covenant And so that eventually, if we read particularly in the genealogy of Matthew, chapter 1, we see what happened because of that child. All the way through generations to generations to generations, Jesus. So God was blessing Abraham, but he was doing it for a purpose. He was doing it for the purpose of being, what's the Abrahamic covenant? A blessing to the nations. It's not just about you, it's about you to the nations. So he's going to give you this child so that you can be a blessing to the nations. And so that long, 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 long time later, 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations, if you're reading Matthew, there is this king of kings, this Messiah comes through this line, and all of a sudden he's not just a Messiah for Israel, he's the Messiah for the Gentiles and for Israel, meaning all of the nations. So God gave Abraham this child, Isaac, so that he could be a blessing to the nations, not to just give him a child. Israel is in Egypt. They are enslaved. And Israel is crying out, to their heavenly father. Why are you letting this happen? Why are we enslaved here? Don't you know how rough this is? People are are growing up in slavery. People are dying in slavery. All of this stuff is happening. They are begging God for somebody to come and to save them. And God sends Moses. And we know because we've studied the Bible that Jesus is the greater Moses. And that the book of Exodus is flat out, straightforward, clear as day, the gospel. We see this mediator, Moses, come in and, and through miracles and the power of God and, the, and, and, and all of these different things that happen within, you should really just spend a lot of time in Exodus, it's awesome. He's able to set the captives free. He's able to get everybody together and walk out of Egypt. Did God do that because God is a good God? Well, yeah, sure. But God did that, why? So that Israel could be a light to the nations. It's not about getting them out of slavery. It's about the purpose for getting them out of slavery. It's not about giving you a child. It's the purpose for which I gave you the child. Jesus himself sent on the mission of God. Before condescension in Philippians 2, before the foundations of the earth, most people would say that the Trinity existed in satisfying, perfect community. Okay? So Jesus steps out of heaven and empties himself in our kenosis passage in chapter 2 of Philippians, right? And He steps down and he becomes lowly. He takes on the form of a servant. He gives up everything, even uh, dependent upon who you talk to, maybe his omniscience in terms of the time of the return of the Father. 
He withholds that from himself. How about that? That's probably the nicest way, better, best way of saying it. And he does that, and he lives, listen, he lives a perfect, sinless life because he likes it? Because, no, be, because he had a purpose. He was sent on a mission. He is the sent one. He is the redeemer. He is the king. And listen to this. Let's listen to this. I wrote this, or I had highlighted this. I didn't write anything. I highlighted this uh, while we were singing a second ago. It's in Luke. Verse 41. This is Jesus in the garden. And he withdrew from them, the inner circle of disciples, about a stone's throw and knelt down praying, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Verse 43, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus is not coming to us for himself. He's not coming to us because he's a good guy. He's not coming to us because Matthew needed a friend. Being a tax collector, he would have been ostracized, right? So he's not there for that point. He's not there to do miracles. Did he, did he heal a bunch of people? Absolutely, he healed a bunch of people. John the Baptist asked, and he said, yeah, go tell him that the, the blind can see, the lame can walk, stuff's happening, the kingdom of God is advancing. But that's not the point. The point is, is that they were healed to provide testimony to who God is. He is a healing God. That's why the kingdom of God is advancing, and you look at Jesus, and every time he's healing person, he's talking about the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because that's what happens in the kingdom of God. People are healed in the kingdom of God. The lame do walk in the kingdom of God. The deaf do hear in the kingdom of God. The blind see in the kingdom of God. And those that are dead are resurrected in the kingdom of God. You look at the disciples. Flip back to Mark chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. And he went up on the mountain and called to those whom he desired, and they came to him. Jesus called those to come to him. Jesus called them to come to him. See that. 14. And he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles. There's the purpose. So that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. He called the disciples not because he wanted them to be a part of some kind of inner group, not because he wanted them to understand that they were going to be significant in some type of weird kingdom hierarchy. He called the disciples to himself. Why? So that he could be with them and send them out to preach. So even the disciples themselves were called to God so that they might go to others. And now look at the church. The church itself, the beloved bride of Christ. We exist so that we might shine a light so that others would see the hope of the gospel. We don't exist so that we can have small groups. Small groups are great. That's not why we're here. We don't exist so that we can go on mission trips. Mission trips are great. That's not why we're here. We don't exist so that you can have a friend. Friends are good. Some of you need friends. At the same time, that's not why we're here. That's one of the things I say to my son is uh, when something difficult comes up, Son, not here to be your buddy. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to be a father. I'm here to raise a godly man. That's what I'm here for. That's what I've been tasked as a steward of you to do. And that's what I'm going to do. And so that's how that works out. Now, he's one and looks at me like I'm stupid, but that's how it goes. So you have to understand that we have a purpose the church doesn't exist for the heck of it. It exists for a purpose. We aren't saved 
because God's good. He is, and that's why he did, did save us. But that's not the reason why we were saved. We're saved for a purpose. We're saved, what we sang about, Holy Spirit, you're welcomed here. It's your glory, God, that our hearts long for. That's what we want to see. Augustine, you know, our hearts are, are basically going to chase every single thing down until they find their rest in you. So you look at Abraham, you look at Israel, you look at Jesus Christ himself, you look at all of the prophets. You think about Ezekiel, I read Ezekiel this week. Ezekiel was married. And God went to Ezekiel and he said, listen, I'm going to take your wife for my purpose. And he even called her, what do you call her, the light of his eyes. So that you might illustrate what I'm feeling and doing with Israel. And this is how this is going to work. But you look at the prophets, you look at Abraham, you look at Moses, you look at Jesus, you look at the disciples, you look at the church, you look at yourself, and you will see that none of that was done for me, but it, but it was done for me. Isn't that confusing? But that's the idea. Because somebody led me to Jesus. Somebody told me about Christ. Somebody showed me what it was like to suffer as someone who loved the Lord. Somebody showed me what it was like to raise a family as somebody who loved the Lord. Somebody discipled me. So it wasn't for me, but it is for me, isn't it? I get the benefit of the purpose of God. I am benefited by the purpose of God because my heart seeks something, it wants something, it needs to be reconciled to the Creator, and it can't. And when God shows us the image of God in the face of Jesus Christ and His glory, our heart goes, yes, that is what I've been looking for. Not all this other junk, but then the fight begins. And it begins to not only keep that in your head and before your eyes daily and hourly and second by second, but it begins so that we can fight for the joy of others. We have to fight for the joy of others. So many times people would look at, at a pastor and they'd say, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty bad. Well, the pastor can take care of that. It's not the pastor's job. It's all of our jobs as Christians to be light for those who are in darkness. It is our job together. If one person stumbles, he's got somebody to help him get up, but woe is a man that falls down but has nobody to help him up. There's going to be times where you're going to be really strong and I'm not going to be really strong. And you're going to have to carry me. And there's going to be times where I'm going to be feeling, feeling like this with the Lord, and you're going to be like, I don't know, Nick. And I'm going to have to speak to you and encourage you to fight for the joy that is in the Lord. None of that is easy. All of that we know, though. It's just it becomes real at certain points in our lives. So you and I are born again for the same purpose as all of these other people all throughout this book. We are born again for the purpose of being light and hope to others. We're born to tell other people there's a better way. You don't have to go down that road. Look, the wrath of God is not something meant for you. Hell was made for Satan and his demons, according to Scripture. Don't go there. You don't need to go there. So finally, and Cole, you can come up if, you, if you're playing today. One of the things that we see in Mark chapter 4, verse 21 is that Jesus said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed 
and not on a stand. Because if you, if you take the lamp and you actually put it on the floor, it just doesn't give as much light. You know, the higher up that it would get, the further out that it would go, of course, depending upon its brightness. So the idea is to say, okay, well, I'm going to put it on this stand so that it would be more bright and so that it would shine better to others. And that's, that's the question that we have is what is it that God is calling us to? What is our lampstand? I was talking to Joseph uh, a second ago. I think he's, he normally sits backstage, maybe. Um, and Joseph and I were talking about different things and uh, his job a little bit and some other things. And, and he talked about a situation and he said, uh, Nick, I'm just telling you, I don't know if I can do it. And I said, well, Joseph, you know, the thing is, is that you're not called to do that. You're called to be faithful in this. And that's the question. A lot of times we look at other people. Um, I, like, I like missionary biographies in particular. I like um, Adoniram Judson and some other people. I mean, just flat out suffered for Jesus. Lost seven children, two wives, um, to the mission of God. And I think about him and I go, well, man, I just don't know. Could I do it? You know, could I be as faithful as him to go over there and into Burma and, and to work so hard and to translate the Bible? It's still the translation they use today, actually, in Burma. Uh, or Myanmar, if you want to call it that. Um, but it's, it's one of those things to where, like, you, you wonder, like, could I do that? And could I be that faithful? Sometimes you put yourself into the Bible as a character, you know, you're like, I don't know. I always, I always pick Samson. I don't know why. I just feel like, I think it's because I have tiny arms. But, you know, I just think, okay, could I do that? And even that is a distraction of Satan. Because what... What are you asking? Could I be this person? That's not what you were asked to be, man. You were asked to be faithful to what the Lord called you to, not to be faithful to what he called somebody else to. So you take your eyes off of what you're supposed to be doing and you start looking at other people. And you start going, well, I think I could do it like that. Well, I think I could be that. Well, maybe I could be that. Well, I don't know. I'd like to do it like that. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what we called you to. God called you to be you, to be that light in particular to these people at this time. That's the whole point in which you were saved. Because you and I would both know, and we would agree on this, we're not good enough. We are sinners. We are outcasts. I mean, you, you go through the, the Ray Comfort thing, you know, his evangelism techniques, and you look at something like he says, well, have you, ever, have you ever lusted after anybody? And you go, well, yeah. And he goes, well, then you're an adulterer. Well, have you ever lied? And you're like, well, yeah. And he's like, okay, well, then you're a liar. Have you ever hated anybody? And you're like, well, yeah. And he's like, okay, so you are an adultery, lying murderer, according to Scripture. And he's absolutely right, by the way. And you go to another pastor who says, you know, like, I don't, I don't even consider myself that much of a sinner. You know, I'm not, I'm not that bad. I, I, I didn't really ever murder anybody. I've never molested anyone. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, you know, just go around shooting up, you know, schools or what. I don't, I don't do these bad things. Those are, those are very horrible acts. I, I, I you know, I've, 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 I have cussed a little bit when I've hit my toe on occasion. You know, maybe in traffic. Um, you know, I've I've lied a couple of times just to you know blah blah blah. <laughs> but that and this is breaking of the law of God, and that will put Jesus and did put Jesus on the cross just as easy as anything else. Because it's that point that we look at ourselves and say, "Oh, well, I'm sort of holy." No, you are not. 
God is holy and dwells in unapproachable light, and there is no reason whatsoever that you or I should ever approach the King of Kings except for the blood of Jesus Christ. That's, that, that's what it has to be. Because if we're honest for a half second and we know ourselves, then we'll say, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be a part of this. I shouldn't be able to see this. I shouldn't even be able to encounter the Lord. And yet Christ is the one who makes you able. And so my question to you is that he may put you up on a lampstand that you're not thrilled about. He may put you in a lampstand of suffering. He may put you in a lampstand of mission. You may have to give up everything you have here in America and move somewhere else to be on that lampstand that he's calling you to be. And your question is, will I be faithful in that? He will, he will be faithful in that. That's, that's a given. You look at all those people I use, who do you think actually completed the Abrahamic covenant? Jesus. Who got the people out of Egypt? Jesus. Who, who did all of this? It was always Christ. Paul says, so that I can't boast in myself, I boast in Jesus nothing within me so we have to ask ourselves am I going to be faithful no matter what he calls me to to be on that lampstand and to be the light and hope and joy for other people because that's what Jesus did and we are to imitate Christ so we just have to we just have to be honest look if you know me then you know I'm pretty straightforward and I'm pretty honest, um, typically probably too honest. I don't have any kind of crazy presentation for you, okay? I don't have anything with like balloon animals or anything that's gonna make you go, well, that was really exciting. That's not my point, that's not my purpose, that's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to tell you what Jesus says. Jesus says that he loves you. Jesus says that there's a better way. Jesus says you don't have to go down that road. He says, find your satisfaction in me, find your purpose in me, and I'm gonna go to the cross for you, and I'm gonna make a way so that you can be with God who created you and loves you. And along that way, after you are saved, I'm gonna set you with a purpose. You are gonna be born again to a purpose and to live this life turning completely away from sin, living in righteousness of God so that you can now be Jesus to other people. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a Bible teacher. You don't have to be someone who prays 24 hours a day. All you have to do is try your best to be Jesus Christ to the person that you meet. That's it. Well, I, I don't know what to say. What do you think Jesus would say? To answer that question, you do have to know him. So think about those things. Think about the fact that, brothers and sisters, we are called to see Jesus and to help others see Jesus. It's not some kind of crazy philosophy or anything wild. It's just straightforward truth. That's just what it is. There's breath in my lungs so that you can see Jesus. And that's the only reason there is. And yeah, I'm a dad, and I'm a husband, and I love my family, and I work in a job, and I, ha and I do all these things, and I have a lot, of, and I enjoy surfing and basketball and all kinds of stuff. I love, love to read. But at the same time, that's not why I exist. He gives us these other things so that we can use them, so that other people can see them. And he puts us on lampstands in our lives so that we can show light of the hope of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to others. And that's, and that's what it is. And that's, that's what I want to fight for you today is to see the joy of Christ and to see your need to work to see others see that joy. That's what this is about is so that you would see the joy of Jesus. 
and that you would make him known to the nations. And, and, and part of the nations is Ladson and Goose Creek. It, it's here too, it's definitely here. It's to this campus. So we have to think about that. We have to think about what is God calling us to be. He's calling us to be faithful. He's calling us to be light. He is the one that gives us the power. He is the one that gives us the words. He takes care of all of the work. And so all you have to do is, is be open to being used, is to be faithful, is to understand who he is, and to try your best to fight to see Jesus and show others Jesus. And that's it. So I'm going to pray for us. I want to ask today, and I want to do this in a particular way. So we had an extremely rough, difficult, sad week uh, as a church. And um, so I know we have to socially distance and all that kind of stuff, but um, you can pray in your seat, you can pray down here in the front, whatever. But I want you to, I want you to consider, because I don't want to tell you what to pray. I want you to pray what you want to pray. I, want, I just want you to consider. I want you to consider how to help others fight for joy. I want you to think about those that you work with, those that you go to church with, those that you do life with. And I want you to ask God to help you fight for joy and to show others how to fight for joy. And it's going to be in the power of Jesus. So let me pray. And then we can do that. So Lord, God, we, we don't come with, with anything wise or persuasive. God, we, we, don't, we don't come with anything flashy or showy. Um, Lord, we just want to be genuine. We just want to show you who we are before you, Lord. God, we know that you're good and we know that your light shined in our hearts one day when we were not Christians. And Lord, that it, that it changed us from the inside out. So Father, I pray that, that, that we would remember that light, if, even if it's just a little flicker right now, Lord. And it's not a, a raging storm. God, we just pray that you would see that, that you would know us where we are. God, I think of the really old David Crowder song that says, this is all that I can say right now. And I just pray that you would be clear to us, that we would see you with our heart, that we would see you with everything that we have, we would see you with the value of the cross, and we would see you as hopeful and beautiful, and that we would make you known to others. God, we thank you for your word, we thank you for Jesus. God, if there's anybody in this room that doesn't know Christ, Lord, that, that they would come and ask us about what it means to know and follow Jesus, what it means to be born again to the purpose that God has put us on. So Father, that you would tighten us up, that you would make us understand why we exist and why you give us the things that you give us so that we might glorify you. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Strengthen us. You are good. We believe it. We trust it. It doesn't make it easy. God, help us to be faithful. Thank you for your word that tells us all about you. Thank you for the hope of heaven. Thank you for the glory to come. Thank you for the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ that is offered freely to all people. That's in your name we pray, amen.